<laughs> Good. So uh, I'll give you a few insights in kinematic alignment. I'll be very balanced. So I will not necessarily take fully the pro on kinematic alignment. This is my disclosure. And for this talk, it is relevant as I will briefly discuss an implant. I think we are facing a paradox. Most of us, when we operate on patients for total knees, deal with deformed knees. And it seems logical that we should correct the deformity. On the other hand, many of us say that total knee arthroplasty is a soft tissue operation, so the surgery should stay within the soft tissue limits. That is logical. The premise for the study that Steve has just shown you is the fact that we assume that ligaments do not shrink. And we think that as we deal with this patient, we restore the volume on the medial side, we'll put the patient back into his native alignment, which will not necessarily be a neutral alignment. So we looked at a cohort of 250 subjects. Steve referenced the paper already and found that about one-third of the males and a little less than one-fifth of the females had the constitutional virus of more than three degrees. That is the Caucasian population as we see it in our country. When we took the follow-up paper and looked at the joint line orientation, we found that in patients with a neutral alignment, there was about three degrees of varus in the joint line on the proximal tibia. That is old knowledge that was already shown by Kapanji. What was new in this study was that in patients with constitutional varus, we found that proximal varus angle to be far higher, so they had a lot more varus in the proximal tibia, and that led to a horizontal joint line as the patients were standing with the feet adjacent. So that was a typical feature of patients with constitutional varus. Now, why is this important? As we perform knee arthroplasty and we perform a perpendicular cut on the tibia, you take out more bone on the lateral side and on the medial side, and we compensate that in the flexion gap by adding rotation, external rotation to the femoral component. So we'll take out less bone on the lateral side and more on the medial side on the femur. So the differential should be equal, and then we have a well-balanced flexion gap. That's all very logical, but if you think about it and you have more proximal varus on the tibia, you will need to add in more external rotation on your femoral component. And that is exactly what was shown in this paper in the Journal of Arthroplasty, as the proximal varus is actually increasing the condylar twist angle, which is the angle between the posterior condyle on the posterior condyle tangent and the transepicondylar axis is also increasing. So patients tend to have a differential rotation in their distal femur as they have more proximal varus. Now, when we talk about that, it is very important to realize the difference between the HKA axis, which gives us the coronal alignment and which can obviously be varus or valgus, and the joint line orientation. Joint line orientation can change independently of the HKA axis. And that is a very important insight. Also, in knee arthroplasty, the joint line level can change after the operation as compared to the pre-op setting. Why do I tell you that story? Because it's important to realize that overall limb alignment will mainly affect kinetics, whereas the individual component position might play a bigger role in kinematics and stability, and that might be the true game changer. What about the kinetics? This is an old paper I published in 1994, and we looked at the angle between the mechanical and the anatomic axis of the femur. And we found it to be differential. In various knees, there is almost always a various position of the femoral neck, so the angle is wider, is greater than in the valgus patients. So we advocated in that paper to fine-tune your distal valgus cut on the femur in order to always go for a neutral alignment. That was the conclusion of that paper. But since then, Sebastian Parat spent some time at the Mayo Clinic and taught us that patients who had a deviating coronal alignment sometimes did as good in terms of long-term follow-up as the patients who had a neutral alignment. So with that knowledge, we could change our technique and now take that five-degree valgus cut for every single patient, 
And that would mean that the majority of the varus patients would be left in little varus, and the majority of the valgus patients would be left in little valgus. So a slight undercorrection of the deformity would result from that knowledge. And intuitively, it is very logical. You start with a large bell curve in terms of alignment of the arthritic patient, and you narrow down the bell curve. So you leave the big varus guys in a little varus and the big valgus guys in a little valgus. That, in contrast to a situation where you cross the line and go from a varus knee into valgus or opposite, would not be a good idea. So that is the intuition behind it. What's the science? For four years, we looked at patient satisfaction in follow-up of Bob Bourne's work in Canada. And this might seem as a busy slide, but it's not. It is showing post-op alignment in the x-axis versus pre-op alignment in the y-axis. And what you see is as you leave valgus patients in valgus, they are not happy. And if you bring varus patients back to neutral or you leave them in a little varus, they are happy. That's the major conclusion of this work by Stefan van Onsen. Second point I'd like to address is the component position and the kinematics. I told you about the joint line obliquity. Given the fact that you take a perpendicular cut on the tibia, it means you'll take out asymmetric amounts of bone on the medial and lateral side on femur and tibia. And as you replace with a symmetric metal and plastic construct, you will change the joint line position. If you do that, I believe it's very important to respect the medial joint line, and they will always try to restore that as meticulously as possible, because the medial side, as we have shown in experimental work, is isometric in its central fibers of the MCL. It's also the most stable side of the knee joint, and that's the logic behind it. Now, if you don't do that, you might end up with an instability, and this has been called paradoxical motion. It's basically a mid-flexion instability that leads to sudden movements and uncertainty in the patient as he's going down the stairs. Steve Howell thought to solve this problem by performing a varus tibial cut and a valgus femoral cut. I'll be very open and very straightforward about that. I don't like the varus tibial cut. I do perform in my daily practice a perpendicular cut on the tibia because the human eye is very good in recognizing perpendicular positions and parallel positions. It's very tough to say whether you have three degrees varus, five degrees or seven degrees varus, and I fear indeed crooked knees if we leave that. A second argument was given by uh, Fabio Catani. He looked with final element analysis at the stresses at the bone cement interface, and he showed that as you leave the tibia in varus, you overload the medial compartment and you might have a problem. In contrast, if you change the position at the femoral component, it seems to be okay. So what do I do in daily practice? I use an asymmetric design in the component, more plastic on the lateral side, less on the medial side, and opposite on the femur. And by, doing so, by doing so, I can keep my perpendicular cut on the tibia. I have a slight undercorrection at the level of the femoral cut, and by doing that, we undercorrect the deformity. That is for the varus knees. The valgus knees, I want to bring them back to neutral because we have shown that leaving valgus in valgus leads to unhappy patients. Leaving varus to a little varus leads to happy patients. With that, I'd like to conclude. Thank you very much.